We all know that Go is great on the back end. It's been called the language of the cloud. But sometimes you need a picture, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about information displays, and through that journey, we're going to talk about it through some packages and tools. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. And then we're going to talk about how Go is great for making information displays. Let's talk to the, uh, to the experts here. Edward Tufte talks about information displays in terms of designing data for precise and effective quick analysis, using small multiples, and optimizing the data and ink ratio. And finally, visual and beautiful evidence. Nigel Holmes, one of the pioneers of information graphics, says, designing for the context. The data visualizer says, what's the data? The information graphics set designer says, what's the story? Here's my definition of an information display. It's simply an interesting arrangement of text and graphics designed to convey a message, to inform you. But let's talk about my motivation of doing this. Many times you're using graphical tools to make charts and graphs and things like that. And I got very, very frustrated with them. Felt like this guy, this Sisyphus uh, thing to try to push pixels around. And I came to the conclusion that programs are so much better at it than I am. It's all about efficiency of my time, being precise, and also having things that are consistently designed. This is a tweet from Fatia Arslan from, um, from Vim Go, who talks about this as well. His whole point is, you know, don't let the tool, i.e. the graphics program, disrupt you. If there's too much disruption, it's time to switch to a new tool. If there's no such tool, it's time to write your own. And I'm privileged to be able to write my own tools and go as a great venue for doing that. We're going to talk about three packages, SVG Go, OpenVG, and DEC. Let's start with SVG Go. SVG Go does one thing. It creates scalable vector graphics, that's the web standard for 2D vectors, to an I.O. writer, and that's all it does. It's meant to be very, very comprehensive of the standard, even implementing things that most things don't. <clears throat> and it's been used in lots of different contexts. But before I get into that, let's think about what does an information display look like? This is Bug Droid. Everybody knows him when you see sort of a cute mascot. But when I see Bug Droid, I think of all the things that make him up. A circle and an arc and a line and a rectangle and a color and round wrecks and scales. Once you're able to do that, you've got superpowers because now you can program those components to anything that you like. This is the API for SVG Go. Every element in the SVG standard has a, a method. And you think in terms of um, dimensions and coordinates. If you do nothing, then you just get the black one, and there's the generated XML there. If you want to style it, you just drop some um, CSS in there using variadic arguments. Thank you, Go. And if you want complete control over the attributes, you just drop exactly the ones that you need. And there you can see there's the code, there's the product. This is the hello world for SVG Go. Again, you think about it in terms of the first one is important is where's this stuff going to go? In this case, it's going to standard out. You think about it in terms of its dimensions and the elements that make it up. You have a start and an end for your picture and a rectangle and a circle and text. And you also think about the relationships between these in order to build the picture that you want. So for example, the text is halfway over and three quarters of the way up. SVG Go comes with a tool called SVG Play. Think of Go Play with pictures, where you can do sketching with code. And this is very, very important as you're working on your design, and I also contend for learning even the Go programming language, having the picture generate right away. You just change a couple of things, boom, 
there you go. You get your change right away. I mentioned that it writes to an I.O. writer, so therefore it's very easy to put this stuff on the web. Here's a little uh, website that I put together to just sort of experiment with some different um, SVG Go um, pictures. If you grab one of them and you say like slash clock, you'll get a clock. If you say flower, and you could play with some parameters and they will change a bit. But the important thing is it's all about turning data into a picture. In this case, I've got uh, an XML kind of contrived representation. And you change that into the picture. And the pattern that has emerged is what I call read, parse, draw. You can read the data, marshal it into your data structures, and then walk it and turn it into a picture. This is a powerful paradigm. Here's an example of what it might look like for doing, let's say, a bar chart. And because you've got I.O. readers and I.O. writers, you can read other people's data, for example, from APIs. The distribution comes with a, a tool called Flickr 50, which grabs, you give it a, a term, it uses the interestingness algorithm, and it gives you a nice poster. Same kind of deal. You grab the API, you get the XML, you turn it into a picture. Let's do a quick tour of some SVG Go clients. This is probably the first one that I wrote because I was very frustrated with something like Visio. And what you do is you lay out your components. It's called a component diagram. You lay out and specify the relationships between them. And if you just move them, it will automatically re redraw them for you. Again, you start to think in terms of grids. This is uh, visualizing Go benchmarks. Regressions going to the left and red. Speed ups green going to the right. You can also visualize things like your Go structures. I'm very much a proponent of using tools and other people's data. Um, Dominic Honiff wrote the program Struct Layout. And you can just take that representation and pipe it straight into this, and then you can see and visualize your goal structures. This is an example of timelines, which are everywhere. Here's the visualization of the Go programming language release history. Stephen Few's bullet charts. In corporate environments, we put things in grids all the time, right? Looking at things from a couple of dimensions. Um, here's a tool that will do that and automate that for you. Similarly, you have these so-called roadmaps. Here's another example of doing, let's say, technology uh, adoption um, in terms of effort and impact, showing it linearly. But with the same data representation, you can also look at, at it radially in a circle. Apple purchases versus stock prices, Twitter update frequency, an example of scale in our solar system. This is a, these are posters from a design competition called Layer Tennis, where one designer starts with an illustration, he volleys it to his opponent, and they go back and forth and back and forth. There's 10 and five volleys, and then a, a winner is declared. These are three posters from the Layer Tennis matches, again done in SVG Go. This is the entire season, Layer four, Season 3, I believe, of layer tennis, culminating in the championship round there at the bottom row. These are NBA shot charts. Most people are familiar, some people in this room are familiar with this particular um, from The Shining, right? The carpet pattern. So I said, how can I do that in um, SVG Go? Okay. It turns out, again, you think in terms of deconstructing the thing into units. Now you can program them. So you start with this basic unit here, and there's the, the Go code on the right-hand side that builds that. And then you have a companion one where you just take it, turn it upside down, shift it to the right a little bit, put it in a loop, boom, you got it. The next tool I want to talk about is OpenVG. This is a Raspberry Pi. How many people have Raspberry Pis? OK, perfect. You know what that is. $35 Linux computer. But what many people don't know is it's got a 2D accelerated graphics built into the system on a chip. And I wanted to be able to program that. So I started with a C library that took the sort of basic things, 
push them up to that same level that designers tend to think in terms of high level objects. And I created a library called OpenVG. Here's some clients, some screenshots of what that looks like. Here's its hello world, which is similar. Again, you think in terms of your starting and your ending. You've got background colors, circles, text, and so forth. This is what its API looks like. Again, it's a very small API. When I'm building these things, I really take the sort of goal minimalist approach. If I don't have a reason for a particular thing, it's not going in. And I'm constantly challenging it. Can I build this? Can I build this? And only when I can't build the thing does it go into the API. So it's all about thinking about it in terms of high level functions, circles and ellipses, arcs and so forth on a 2D canvas. This is a program called TWH. It stands for Time, Weather, and Headlines. The weather comes from Forecast.io. The headlines come from um, the New York Times or Hacker News. And it's written in, a, in OpenVG. I wanted to build one of these magic mirror things, right? Um, yes, I was up at 3 AM. <coughs> 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 And I tried sort of, there's a, um, a tabletop model, but this is where it actually landed. This is in my kitchen, and it just becomes part of the furniture now. So I've got this ambient information display that gives me nice information all the time. So how's that implemented? The main function here is you set up tickers, okay? Every minute for the time, five minutes for the weather, 10 minutes for the uh, headlines, and a four select loop. And as these things fire, they update the screen independently. And there you've got it. Okay. The last tool I want to talk about is DEC. DEC is a Go package for presentations. Obviously, you're watching a DEC presentation right now. Um, and what's interesting about it is, as I've been working with this more and more, it's turned into a sort of universal canvas that I can do many things with it. This is, uh, makes your presentations GitHubable, right? So now this is up on GitHub, and you can send me PRs and issues for things that I did wrong. And also, now this thing begins to live, right? I want presentations that my grandson can be able to display, right? Not locked up in proprietary things, but a very simple representation. This is the anatomy of a deck. There's only about less than a dozen elements. Right? So you've got the, the deck in and begin, you've got slides begin and end, and you've got elements for text, images, lists, lines, and graphics, and so forth. Look at that markup. That markup makes that slide. Okay? But it's important, how am I going to lay out these things? I wanted to have a simplifying way to do this. Everything is done on a percent grid. Everything. X goes from left to right, Y goes from bottom to top. And that's how layout is done of all of your particular elements. This is a very simplifying um, paradigm. And this is what it looks like if you're sort of laying things out. The text is at 1050. The picture is at 5050 right dead in the middle. And the, the shape is there on the right. This has some great capabilities because now you, the, your product, your content will scale to the canvas and you don't have to do anything because you're doing it according to percentages. This is very powerful. Some people, cave people like me, tend to do markup by hand, right? But in many cases, <clears throat> you want to have a process that's going to generate this code for you and then it can be rendered on different kinds of devices. VGDeck is the one for the Raspberry Pi. PDF is the one that I use, and also can generate SVG. So to facilitate this, there's a companion package called Deck Generate. Again, you can see the sort of thing. You're still talking in terms of high-level functions. Texts, blocks of text, various alignments, code lists, and then your graphical elements as well. Again, on that 2D canvas in this case, with the um, uh, percentage base. Here's a program that makes slides, right? So you start with your deck object. 
you start your slides and end your slides, and then you have your code in between them. Here's an example of uh, a very simple slide that sets the, the background, and it aligns text to the left, center, and right. And then it draws a line right down the middle. Again, you can see the, the coordinates there. Because it's a Go package, you can use the standard Go, Go data of like slices to make lists. So you just hand it, if you want a list, you just hand it it. There you got your bulleted lists. One of the things I like to do in presentations, having these sort of hero image and then some text around it, here's a way to make that particular slide. So as you're doing this and making these presentations, you may come up with a template, a way that you're making this over and over again. And then you can start at an either higher level with a higher level description of your slides. I was thinking of the GIFs um, that was in the keynote, right? So you could just have, all right, slide one is a GIF slide, right? So in this case, a title, a section, and a caption, and then you can have a program that will generate the markup. Boom, there's your slides automatically. And then you're not pushing pixels around. You're letting the program do it for you. Again, efficiency and precision. As I was walking through this, even with starting with even shell functions, you can have a simple, what I call little language for laying out the slide. So remember the example slide there. That description makes that slide without having to write your markup. This is really nice if you have other programs that are also generating markup for you, and then you can automate the whole process. DEC has a web API. I built this again on the um, Raspberry Pi. So the idea was you've got some server somewhere where all your content is. You can push content there. You can remove it. Um, you can start your slide deck, all of that kind of thing. And that turns out to be useful because that same display that's in my kitchen doing TWH can show fine art slideshows. This is Rene Magritte. <clears throat> so let's go through some design examples quickly. So again, when you're thinking about it, I think in terms of regions, a top and a bottom and a left and a right. Um, and then think about the proportions between them, 10% top and bottom, 30% left, 70% right. Then think semantically, a header and a footer and a summary and a detail. Once you've got that, then you can pour that design to create your slides. Here's one example. Here's another one. Here's something that you might see in an airport. Again, an information display. Speaking of airports, I was on a recent flight and I saw this displayed in the seat back uh, display. And then every time I see something like I said, can I build that? Nine times out of 10, the answer is yes. So imagine this kind of display being fed in real time, if you will, from um, the, the flight computer. Another example of stocks, again, generated by a Go program. Things got bad that day. <coughs> <laughs> and here's the uh, Go program that generates that. Again, in a function, you start with a loop that's going to grab the data from somebody's stock API, and then you immediately just lay out your content, in this case, in columns. Or you have to make a little decision there, um, here, right? If it's positive, it's green. If it's negative, it's red. And this function builds the, those. I like to do illustrations of interesting things that I see. So here's one from way back when from Andrew McKenzie Ross. So the next time you're about to make a subclass, think hard and ask, what would Go do? <clears throat> here's another take on documenting the Go program. Rob Pike wrote the Go Proverbs a couple of years ago, and it was a perfect opportunity for me for illustrating these things, right? So I wrote a presentation to do it. To me, this is a business opportunity. How many people would buy t-shirts that had the Go Proverbs on them? Okay, <clears throat> all right, business opportunity, right? <clears throat> this one is my favorite, I love this one. <clears throat> 
I'm also interested in typesetting, you know, classical text and so forth. This is from Alice in Wonderland, obviously. Um, and I even have the sort of long tail typography thing that was in the original. Again, done with deck. For my own work, this is where I came to the conclusion that it's not just for presentations. It can be done for whole documents and therefore libraries of documents. I'm documenting, for example, SVG Go examples where you've got code and picture. I'm very fascinated with that juxtaposition. Where you've got a list of Go programs, you run them, it creates the picture, and it automatically creates the document for you. This is what they look like, page by page. There's our friend from The Shining. There's a, an example from Piet Mondrian. <clears throat> other examples. The other thing, again, I love this, this idea of illustrating things that I see, and I found this one fascinating as well. An example about, um, this was before the current troubles, but um, it was prescient, I thought. <clears throat> The last thing I want to talk about is dchart, which is charts for Go. If you're doing presentations and so forth, sometimes you need a chart. So this is, over the uh, holiday, I built this particular package to do these kinds of charts. They become embedded right into your presentation. There's 10 different kinds of charts, lots of bars, dots, volumes, scattered lines, donuts, pmaps, and pgrids for proportional data. But the whole idea is you start from a simple representation of data, the simplest I can think of, that's just a vector of, vi of labels and values. It can be tab separated or CSVs because they're everywhere. Dchart reads that, turns it into deck content, and then that can be rendered as a PDF. This is a literal pipeline that you can use for your data. Dchart has a million options, 38, right? Um, I mean, you think that's a lot, but you have to use them surgically, and they're all there for a reason. But what I like is you need to have very sensible defaults. That's one of my problems with things like Microsoft Word and those kinds of things, and the defaults are horrible, right? So if you just say Dchart and then just give it some data, you get a bar chart with the values, okay? If you want to add more things, you just again, surgically apply those particular options. You can scale things, you can add things like axes and, and grids and so forth. Here's a Go program that generates the, um, the sign function, right? Very simple. Again, anything that can generate data in this format, boom, you can chart it. You just take that data and pipe it right into dchart, give it a couple of options, you get this. Change a couple of ones, you can get another one. You can also composite things together, right? In this case, I'm plotting the sine and the cosine function. And because you've got complete control over where things are, you can composite things together really nicely. This is also shown in, um, again, going back to stocks, showing the closing price and the volume. This is data that's all composited together to make one particular chart what Tufty, again, would call small multiples. My final example is just looking at um, articles and so forth, being able to grab them and come up with a compelling way to show them. This is an example of, of an article I found in Pew Research around multi-generational households. Okay, that's the tour. But what is it about Go that makes this happen? Go is a batteries included language, and the batteries are pretty good in that the standard um, library. Fumpt is used a lot if you're generating these kinds of things. Very useful to have. My favorite Go keyword is Fumpt. Because now when I see that, I can, now the action's gonna happen. Now I know I can think in terms of the functional things that I'm going to be able to make. What is the relationship between these objects? can think in functional terms. IO Writer is great, obviously, because you can spray your content wherever you want. IO Reader is nice because you can read anybody's data. That HTTP allows me to talk to uh, APIs nicely. 
the various encoding things, XML, JSON, CSV, are just built in and help me there. Cgo is great if you need it for doing things like OpenVG. But also, I've got to give a shout out to the community. People are writing packages that I can use or the generating data that I can use, like GoFPDF or Dominic Conniff's uh, struct layout. And I always like to show this slide. Back in 2010, when Go was very young from Russ Cox, when I was just playing with SVG Go and posting things to Golang Nuts, he said, are you going to share the library or just tease us with pictures, right? So when I got that email, that was the impetus for me to start to share that and start the journey that I'm sharing with you now. Again, when I'm thinking about this notion of tools, let's even go back in time when Dennis Ritchie is talking about the development of the C programming language. He's talking about Thompson as Ken Thompson. Thompson wanted to create a comfortable environment, computing environment constructed according to his own design, using whatever means are available. I'm a little bit more fortunate than Ken Thompson. I don't have a PDP-7 in the attic, but I've got the Go programming language to do that. Rob Pike echoed this when he talked about the design of Go programming language. Go is not the product of a Whiggish development process. We were just trying to get something that worked for us. And to me, it's all about making tools, tools that work the way that I like to be able to work. Again, I want to say I'm privileged to be able to program. And that's, again, a superpower that I want everybody to be able to have. And it's also very fun. Okay? When your program and your picture come together, it's nice. I think that computing and programming is a creative endeavor, just like creating these things as well. So being able to pull those things together is nice. To me, it's all about reducing the distance from the idea to the picture. So in conclusion, I want you to think about channeling these two guys, bringing the art and the code together, Picasso and Turing, to make wonderful and beautiful information displays. Thank you.